Welcome back to the CAST series of instructional videos covering concrete material and construction. In this video we're going to work through the forming of concrete and I guess the different systems in how suspended um, slabs and multi-storey concrete uh, construction um, occurs. As opposed to the slab on ground um, systems the suspended systems are, uh, I guess, a little bit more uh, controlled and also um, more systematic in the way um, that they can be described. We can see here a very simple um, construction system which is a concrete um, slab spanning in one way between two walls. So this is a single span or a one way span. Now, well, often uh, during construction, or rather not during construction but during design, we want to size the uh, construction uh, elements, the thickness and the heights and so on, with a reasonable uh, degree of foresight, but not necessarily to a level of detail that an engineer would look at it. Now, because an engineer um, comes into the design process a little bit later than an architect, what an architect needs to be able to do is to understand construction systems, to understand, I guess, the material allowances for it, the thicknesses of these things, so that when uh, the architect provides the information to the engineer, the engineer's got um, adequate um, space or allowance to work with and it doesn't require a lot of significant redesign of the uh, fundamental geometry um, of the primary elements of the building. Now these uh, I guess um, broad sizing or, or guesstimations of um, structure systems are called rules of thumb. Um, there's a lot of common rules of thumb which uh, allow us to sort of um, slightly overestimate but give reasonably um, realistic uh, size allowances for different materials. Now in this instance a rule of thumb for um, a in situ concrete wall or I guess the minimum that you'd really want to um, draw it at is 150 millimeters. Now the rules of thumb for uh, concrete spans and so on does depend on the, the type of system um, be it single, um, two-way spans and so on and it also depends on the strength of concrete used and the way it's been placed. So the rule of thumb um, is a little bit elastic but these give you some guidelines. So for a simple span, uh, one-way span going about 4.5 meters in this instance uh, a thickness of about 200 millimeters for a slab would be adequate or if we were pushing that out to 6 meters maybe 250 millimeters thick would also be um, quite okay. Now a two-way span as uh, the name suggests is a slab that is um, I guess uh, distributing loads down through columns um, in both an X and a Y um, direction. Now two-way spanning slabs are more efficient than one-way spanning slabs because of um, the ability to sort of balance out um, compression and tension um, in the structure, but they also tend to be um, more sophisticated structures as well. Now, when we're setting out uh, structure systems, um, we tend to set them out on a regular sort of uh, pattern or grid. Now, in an ideal world, a an evenly spaced grid for a two-way span is going to be the most optimum uh, structure system. Now that's clearly never going to be um, uh, always possible, particularly when you're having to accommodate car parking grids and so on coming up from the basement. But that's the ideal, trying to get um, as much symmetry and equilibrium in the system as possible. Now there is a, I guess, a limitation uh, to a degree with the sort of proportioning of a grid and as soon as we get uh, to a rectangular grid where um, we've got a ratio of 2 to 1 um, for the grid 
it starts to become um, quite inefficient after that. So I guess two to one for a grid is, is possibly um, the limit uh, to the efficiency. So somewhere between two to one and one to one for a, a grid proportioning system is probably a good place um, to aim for. Now again for uh, an approximate rule of thumb for s uh, slab thickness um, for something around about uh, a um, six meter span you could be looking around about a 200 millimeter thick slab and for different spans after that six to eight meters getting up to 275 millimeters thick and for eight to ten sort of 325 mil thick now the studio guide um, for architects for preliminary design which is on the reading list gives a much more um, expanded um, set of uh, rules of thumb for all, all types of construction and we strongly recommend you um, refer to that uh, during design and perhaps even take the opportunity having gone through these videos to have a, a bit of a look through there. Now the other rule of thumb um, that is often used is that um, the depth of a slab is about 1 28th of the span. So it's expressed here as the length um, equals the depth of the span by 28. So that gives you another um, cross-referencing rule of thumb when you're calculating the thickness of a slab. Now the the size of the columns themselves is also quite important and again equilibrium um, is always um, a better state to be in. Now if we're doing um, just a typical like three to three uh, say a three meter high column in a or three even to three to four meters something around a 250 millimeter square column is getting close to ideal but that's probably the minimum you'd want to draw it at. Now if you're um, constructing uh, thinner, uh, longer columns like fins for example as a structural column then the minimum thickness you really want to go down to wouldn't be any less than sort of 200 millimeters and the proportion where it, it starts to become a bit more of a problem is 1 to 3. So 1 to 3 in terms of the width to the, to the breadth of the column is getting close to um, anything more than that and you're starting to ask for a bit of a problem with the construction. For circular columns it's easy um, and again 250 millimeter diameter is a, a good indicative rule of thumb um, when you're designing uh, your early structure systems. Now with designing um, two-way structures um, because there's um, a lot of, I guess, shear um, stress or pressure um, at the tops of the columns, in order to sort of optimize um, the the thickness of the slab, often what you'll see are the shear or column caps uh, constructed um, on top of columns. Now, these um, column caps are the, the thickness of them is approximately usually the, the same thickness of, as the slab and the area of the um, column cap is about a third of the um, typical span of that slab and what that does is that it just gives more space within the reinforced uh, concrete to distribute um, the uh, loads from the the slab down into the column gives more space for the steel and, and more capacity um, to arrange that, that complicated junction. The other common thing what we see is um, I guess drop uh, or beams or drop beams uh, integrated into the slab itself. Now it's, it's the big um, advantage of uh, a plastic material like concrete um, that you can make these quite consistent um, and I, I guess structure systems that uh, flow e um, easily between the distribution of horizontal and vertical loads. It's different to say um, other frame systems like steel or timber which are not consistent and re rely on mechanical fastenings 
in this instance everything is sort of um, bonded together and, and it's a sort of monolithic concrete that uh, binds it all together. Now these drop beams um, they can either be broad sort of band beams like shown here or they can be um, quite narrow and more towards the I guess the thickness of the the column themselves. Again um, when we're calculating the, the thickness or the depth of these band beams we, we calculate it from the top of the slab to the underside um, of the beam so when we're saying in this instance a rule of thumb of approximately 350 millimeter thick for a say a typical span that would be measured from the top of the slab so it includes the thickness of the slab as well um, so going right up to sort of 8 to 10 meters um, we would then start to see um, much deeper uh, drop beams, you know, even down up to 600 millimeters thick. So one needs to sort of balance, I guess, the the width of the beam, the depth of the beam, and the floor to floor height, because particularly for multi-rise buildings where services would be running through the ceiling, the depth of those um, uh, beams and drop beams um, becomes very important. We also have the capacity to form beams that go upwards as well and again these can form um, part of the structure itself as well as providing both fire separation between levels and um, ending up being sort of part of perhaps the um, facade articulation or design. A bit more of an unusual type of structure um, or slab structure is is the waffle slab. You don't see many um, buildings like this, and it's not as popular anymore because um, it's quite a complicated way to set out a slab. Although there are quite a lot of, um, I guess, uh, pre-made systems that um, allow you to quite easily do a waffle slab. It does mean um, a lot more work during the sort of formwork phase. Uh, you do notice here as well that the um, waffle um, where the column engages is usually solid again to act as a kind of a shear cap to that column and, and to help uh, tie all of the reinforcing together. Now waffle slabs um, are mainly used for, for larger grid spacings um, so getting up to sort of 10 metre grids and so on. Um, they're very deep slabs, um, very, very difficult um, to integrate services through them. And what you find is that waffle slabs are used, usually exposed, because they can be quite attractive. Um, and when they're painted up, they can um, provide the sort of finished surface. So although they're more expensive, it does save having to put an um, exposed ceiling. Um, but you also do then have to um, expose your services, which means they have to be very carefully done and well orchestrated and well finished. So you see a lot of uh, waffle slabs, for example, used in lab buildings, which have quite wide spacings and where you want to see um, the services running through and be able to easily change them um, periodically. It also gives a much uh, more stable slab, so less vibration and so on. So it's a bit more of a specialist thing, it's not something you would use every day and certainly not in, in more cost effective um, commercial or uh, multi-rise domestic construction. Then we have all series, uh, types of uh, post tensioning in the slab which again uses um, cables that are run through a sheath that are, are built into the slab which um, at a certain point during the curing process are um, pull tight or, or tightened with a, a mechanical jack. So it gives a bit of, um, I guess, stressing to the slab that does actually give it a lot more strength so you can get uh, a, a better sort of strength to, to depth ratio um, of the slab itself. That ends this section um, where we're looking at uh, suspended uh, slab uh, construction types. But uh, thanks a lot for listening and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get your attention for some future videos as well.